Chapter twenty two. I trust that my readers have not concluded from the preceding chapter on books that reading is my only pleasure. My pleasures and amusements are many and varied. More than once in the course of my story, I have referred to my love of the country and of out of door sports. When I was quite a little girl, I learned to row and swim. When I am at Wrentham, Massachusetts, I almost live in my boat. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than to take my friends out rowing when they come to visit me. Of course, I cannot guide the boat very well. Some one usually sits in the stern and manages the rudder while I row. Sometimes, however, I go rowing without the rudder. It is fun to try and steer by the scent of water grasses and lilies and of bushes that grow on the shore. I use oars with leather bands which keep them in position in the oar locks and I know by the resistance of the water when the oars are evenly poised. In the same manner I can also tell when I am pulling against the current. I like to contend with wind and wave. What is more exhilarating than to make your staunch little boat, obedient to your will and muscle, go skimming lightly over glistening, tilting waves, and to feel the steady, imperious surge of the water? I also enjoy canoeing and I suppose you will smile when I say that I especially like it on moonlit nights. I cannot, it is true, see the moon climb up the sky behind the pines and steal softly across the heavens, making a shining path for us to follow. But I know she is there, and as I lie back among the pillows and put my hand in the water, I fancy that I feel the shimmer of her garments as she passes. Sometimes a daring little fish slips between my fingers, and often a pond lily presses shyly against my hand. Frequently, as we emerge from the shelter of the cove or inlet, I am suddenly conscious of the spaciousness of the air about me. A luminous warmth seems to enfold me. Whether it comes from the trees which have been heated by the sun, or from the water, I can never discover. I have had the same strange sensation even in the heart of the city. I have felt it on cold stormy days and at night. It is like the kiss of warm lips on my face. My favourite amusement is sailing. In the summer of 1901 I visited Nova Scotia and had the opportunity such as I had not enjoyed before to make the acquaintance of the ocean. After spending a few days in Evangeline's country, about which Longfellow's beautiful poem has woven a spell of enchantment, Miss Sullivan and I went to Halifax, where we remained the greater part of the summer. The harbour was our joy, our paradise. What glorious sails we had to Bedford Basin, to McNabb's Island, to York Redoubt, and to the northwest arm. And at night, what soothing, wondrous hours we spent in the shadow of the great, silent men of war. Oh, it was all so interesting, so beautiful. The memory of it is a joy for ever. One day we had a thrilling experience. It was a regatta in the northwest arm, in which the boats from different warships were engaged. We went in a sailboat along with many others to watch the races. Hundreds of little sailboats swung to and fro close by, and the sea was calm. When the races were over, and when we turned our faces homeward, one of the party noticed a black cloud drifting in from the sea, which grew and spread and thickened until it covered the whole sky. The wind rose, and the waves chopped angrily at unseen barriers. Our little boat confronted the gale fearlessly, with sails spread and ropes taut, she seemed to sit upon the wind. Now she swelled in the billows, now she sprang upward on a gigantic wave, only to be driven down with angry howl and hiss. Down came the mainsail. Tacking and jibbing, we wrestled with opposing winds that drove us from side to side with impetuous fury. Our hearts beat fast, and our hands trembled with excitement, not fear, for we had the hearts of Vikings, and we knew that our skipper was master of the situation. He had steered through many a storm, with firm hand and sea-wise eye. As they passed us, the large craft and the gunboats in the harbour saluted, and the seamen shouted applause for the master of the only little sailboat that ventured out into the storm. At last, cold, hungry and weary, we reached our pier. Last summer I spent in one of the loveliest nooks of one of the most charming villages in New England. Brenton, Massachusetts is associated with nearly all of my joys and sorrows. For many years, Red Farm, by King Philip's Pond, the home of J. E. Chamberlain and his family, was my home. I remember with deepest gratitude the kindness of these dear friends and the happy days I spent with them. 
the sweet companionship of their children meant much to me i joined in all their sports and rambles through the woods and frolics in the water the prattle of the little ones and their pleasure in the stories i told them of elf and gnome of hero and wily bear are pleasant things to remember mr chamberlain initiated me into the mysteries of tree and wild flower until with the little ear of love i heard the flow of sap in the oak and saw the sun glint from leaf to leaf thus it is that even as the roots shut in the darksome earth share in the tree-top's joyance and conceive of sunshine and wide air and winged things by sympathy of nature so do i gave evidence of things unseen it seems that there is in each of us a capacity to comprehend the impressions and emotions which have been experienced by mankind from the beginning each individual has a subconscious memory of the green earth and murmuring waters and blindness and deafness cannot rob him of this gift from past generations this inherited capacity is a sort of sixth sense a soul sense which sees hears feels all in one i have many tree friends in Rentum. one of them a splendid oak is the special pride of my heart i take all my other friends to see this king tree it stands on a bluff overlooking king philip's pond and those who are wise in tree law say it must have stood there eight hundred or a thousand years there is a tradition that under this tree king philip the heroic indian chief gazed his last on earth and sky i had another tree friend gentle and more approachable than the great oak a linden that grew in the dooryard at red farm one afternoon during a terrible thunderstorm i felt a tremendous crash against the side of the house and knew even before they told me that the linden had fallen we went out to see the hero that had withstood so many tempests and it wrung my heart to see him prostrate who had mightily striven and was now mightily fallen but i must not forget i was going to write about last summer in particular as soon as my examinations were over miss sullivan and i hastened to this green nook where we have a little cottage on one of the three lakes for which Rentham is famous here the long sunny days were mine and all thoughts of work and college and the noisy city were thrust into the background in Rentham we caught echoes of what was happening in the world war alliance social conflict we heard of the cruel unnecessary fighting in the faraway pacific and learnt of the struggles going on between capital and labour we knew that beyond the border of our eden men were making history by the sweat of their brows when they might better make a holiday but we little heeded these things these things would pass away here were lakes and woods and broad daisy starred fields and sweet-breathed meadows and they shall endure for ever people who think that all sensations reach us through the eye and ear have expressed surprise that i should notice any difference except possibly the absence of pavements between walking in city streets and in country roads they forget that my whole body is alive to the conditions about me the rumble and roar of the city smite the nerves of my face and i feel the ceaseless tramp of an unseen multitude and the dissonant tumult frets my spirit the grinding of heavy wagons on hard pavements and the monotonous clangour of machinery are all the more torturing to the nerves if one's attention is not diverted by the panorama that is always present in the noisy streets to people who can see in the country one sees only nature's fair works and one's soul is not saddened by the cruel struggle for mere existence that goes on in the crowded city several times i have visited the narrow dirty streets where the poor live and I grow hot and indignant to think that good people should be content to live in fine houses and become strong and beautiful, while others are condemned to live in hideous, sunless tenements and grow ugly, withered and cringing. The children who crowd these grimy alleys, half-clad and underfed, shrink away from your outstretched hand as if from a blow. Dear little creatures, they crouch in my heart and haunt me with a constant sense of pain. There are men and women to all gnarled and bent out of shape i have felt their hard rough hands and realized what an endless struggle their existence must be no more than a series of scrimmages thwarted attempts to do something their life seems an immense disparity between effort and opportunity the sun and the air are god's free gifts to all we say but are they so in yonder city's dingy alleys the sun shines not and the air is foul oh man 
how dost thou forget and obstruct thy brother man and say give us this day our daily bread when he has none o oh, would that men would leave the city its splendour and its tumult and its gold and return to wood and field and simple honest living then would their children grow stately as noble trees and their thoughts sweet and pure as wayside flowers it is impossible not to think of all of this when i return to the country after a year of work in town what a joy it is to feel the soft springy earth under my feet once more to follow grassy roads that lead to ferny brooks where i can bathe my fingers in a cataract of rippling notes or to clamber over a stone wall into green fields that tumble and roll and climb in riotous gladness next to a leisurely walk i enjoy a spin on my tandem bicycle it is splendid to feel the wind blowing on my face and the springy motion of my iron steed the rapid rush through the air gives me a delicious sense of strength and buoyancy and the exercise makes my pulses dance and my heart sing whenever it is possible my dog accompanies me on a walk or ride or sail i have had many dog friends huge mastiffs soft-eyed spaniels wood wise setters and honest homely bull terriers at present the lord of my affections is one of these bull terriers he has a long pedigree a crooked tail and the drollest fizz in dogdom my dog friends seem to understand my limitations and always keep close beside me when i am alone i love their affectionate ways and the eloquent wag of their tails when a rainy day keeps me indoors i amuse myself after the manner of other girls i like to knit and crochet i read in the happy-go-lucky way i love here and there a line or perhaps i play a game of two of checkers or chess with a friend i have a special board on which i play these games the squares are cut out so that the men stand in them firmly the black checkers are flat and the white ones curved on top each checker has a hole in the middle in which a brass knob can be placed to distinguish the king from the commons the chessmen are of two sizes white larger than black so that i have no trouble in following my opponent's manoeuvres by moving my hands lightly over the board after a play the jar made by shifting the men from one hole to another tells me when it is my turn if i happen to be all alone and in an idle mood i play a game of solitaire of which i am very fond i use playing cards marked in the upper right hand corner with braille symbols which indicate the value of the card if there are children around nothing pleases me so much as to frolic with them i find even the smallest child excellent company and i am glad to say that children usually like me they lead me about and show me the things they are interested in of course the little ones cannot spell on their fingers but i manage to read their lips if i do not succeed they resort to dumb show sometimes i make a mistake and do the wrong thing a burst of childish laughter greets my blunder and the pantomime begins all over again i often tell them stories or teach them a game and the winged hours depart and leave us good and happy museums and art stores are also sources of pleasure and inspiration doubtless it will seem strange to many that the hand unaided by sight can feel action sentiment beauty in the cold marble and yet it is true that i derive genuine pleasure from touching great works of art as my fingertips trace line and curve they discover the thought and emotion which the artist has portrayed i can feel in the faces of gods and heroes hate courage and love just as i can detect them in living faces i am permitted to touch i feel in diana's posture the grace and freedom of the forest and the spirit that tames the mountain lion and subdues the fiercest passions my soul delights in the repose and gracious curves of the venus and in bare's bronzes the secrets of the jungle are revealed to me a medallion of homer hangs on the wall of my study conveniently low so that i can easily reach it and touch the beautiful sad face with loving reverence how well i know each line in that majestic brow tracks of life and bitter evidences of struggle and sorrow those sightless eyes seeking even in the cold plaster for the light and the blue skies of his beloved hellas but seeking in vain that beautiful mouth firm and true and tender it is the face of a poet and of a man acquainted with sorrow ah how well i understand his deprivation the perpetual night in which he dwelt o oh, dark dark amid the blaze of noon irrevocably dark total eclipse without all hope of day in imagination i can hear homer singing 
as with unsteady unhesitating steps he gropes his way from camp to camp singing of life of love of war of the splendid achievements of a noble race it was a wonderful glorious song and it won the blind poet an immortal crown the admiration of all ages i sometimes wonder if the hand is not more sensitive to the beauties of the sculpture than the eye i should think the wonderful rhythmical flow of lines and curves could be more subtly felt than seen be this as it may i know that i can feel the heart-throbs of the ancient greeks in their marble gods and goddesses another pleasure which comes more rarely than the others is going to the theatre i enjoy having a play described to me while it is being acted on stage far more than reading it because it seems as if i were living in the midst of stirring events it has been my privilege to meet a few great actors and actresses who have the power of so bewitching you that you forget time and place and live again in the romantic past i have been permitted to touch the face and costume of miss ellen terry as she impersonated our ideal of a queen and there was about her that divinity that hedges sublimest woe beside her stood sir henry irving wherein the symbols of kinship and there was a majesty of intellect in his every gesture and attitude and the royalty that subdues and overcomes in every line of his sensitive face in the king's face which he wore as the mask there was a remoteness and inaccessibility of grief which i shall never forget i also know mr jefferson i am proud to count him among my friends i go to see him whenever i happen to be where he is acting the first time i saw him act was while at school in new york he played rip van winkle i had often read the story but i had never felt the charm of rip's slow quaint kind ways as i did in the play mr jefferson's beautiful pathetic representation quite carried me away with delight i have a picture of old rip in my fingers which they will never lose after the play miss sullivan took me to see him behind the scenes and i felt of his curious garb and his flowing hair and beard mr jefferson let me touch his face so that i could imagine how he looked on waking from that strange sleep of twenty years and he showed me how poor old rip staggered to his feet i have also seen him in the rivals once while i was calling on him in boston he acted the most striking parts of the rivals for me the reception room where we sat served for a stage he and his son seated themselves at the big table and bob acres wrote his challenge i followed all his movements with my hands and caught the drollery of his blunders and gestures in a way that would have been impossible had it all been spelt to me then they rose to fight the duel and i followed the swift thrusts and parries of the swords and the waverings of poor bob as his courage oozed out at his finger ends then the great actor gave his coat a hitch and his mouth a twitch and in an instant i was in the village of falling water and felt schneider's shaggy head against my knee mr jefferson recited the dialogues of rip van winkle in which the tear came close upon the smile he asked me to indicate as far as i could the gestures and actions that should go with the lines of course i have no sense whatever of dramatic action and could only make random guesses but with masterful art he suited the action to the word the sigh of rip as he murmurs is a man so soon forgotten when he is gone the dismay with which he searches for dog and gun after his long sleep and his comical irresolution over the signing of the contract with derrick all these seem to be right out of life itself that is the ideal life where things happen as we think they should i remember well the first time i went to the theatre it was twelve years ago elsie leslie the little actress was in boston and miss sullivan took me to see her in the prince and the pauper i shall never forget the ripple of alternating joy and woe that ran through that beautiful little play or the wonderful child who acted it after the play i was permitted to go behind the scenes and meet her in her royal costume it would have been hard to find a lovelier or more lovable child than elsie as she stood with a cloud of golden hair floating over her shoulders smiling brightly showing no signs of shyness or fatigue though she had been playing to an immense audience i was only just learning to speak and had previously repeated her name until i could say it perfectly imagine my delight when she understood the few words i spoke to her and without hesitation stretched her hand to greet me is it not true then that my life with all its limitations 
touches at many points the life of the world beautiful. Everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence, and I learn, whatever state I may be in, therein to be content. Sometimes, it is true, a sense of isolation enfolds me like a cold mist, as I sit alone and wait at life's shut gate. Beyond there is light, and music, and sweet companionship, but I may not enter. Fate, silent, pitiless, bars away. Fain would I question his imperious decree, for my heart is still undisciplined and passionate. But my tongue will not utter the bitter futile words that rise to my lips, and they fall back into my heart like unshed tears. Silence sits immense upon my soul. Then comes hope, with a smile, and whispers, There is joy in self-forgetfulness. So I try to make the light in others' eyes my sun, the music in others' ears my symphony, the smile on others' lips my happiness. End of chapter